Hi, I'm Daisha Seifer, and I'm going to demonstrate how to compute a paired samples t-test using SPSS. As you can see, I have the example data set from exercise 32 of your Grove and Cipher textbook on the screen. These data were collected from patients who were enrolled in a study of uh, GERD. These were folks who were uh, suffering from gastroesophageal reflux disease. They were followed over a two-week period of time where during that time they were, uh, their use of PPIs was removed. So they couldn't use a PPI for two weeks and they were followed over time. And the dependent variable and the values that you see on your screen uh, represent the, the, the variable, those values represent esophageal impedance, where uh, it is an index of mucosal integrity, where higher numbers are indicative of more desirable uh, and healthy esophageal functioning, and lower numbers are indicative of less healthy functioning. So higher numbers are better here. And the null hypothesis was there is no change in esophageal impedance from baseline to follow-up for patients with GERD who had stopped taking PPIs. So these data are appropriate for a paired samples t-test. A paired samples t-test would be computed when you have a design where you have one group of patients or people assessed repeatedly. Uh, in particular, for a paired samples t-test assessed twice. So uh, the, the design is appropriate so far for paired samples t-test, but you also must, um, your data must be approximately normally distributed, which we can test. The data need to be at least ordinal, if not interval or ratio. Um, ordinal data are appropriate if the normality assumption is met. Um, otherwise, it's time for a non-parametric alternative, such as a Wil Wilcoxon signed rank test. So let's test our uh, normality assumption to see if we can move further. We're going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and Explore. We'll move over the two variables and click Plots and Normality Plots with Tests. Continue and OK. What we're looking for here is just the one table that reports the tests of normality. And of course, as we learned in uh, exercise 26, we are looking at the test of normality that's appropriate for small samples, the Shapiro-Wilk test. So we're looking at this p-value here for baseline impedance and this p-value here for two-week follow-up. Both of these p-values are above or greater than 0.05 or alpha 0.05, meaning that the results are non-significant. A non-significant assumptions test like this means that the data meet the normality assumption. In other words, these, uh, these data and their distributions did not significantly deviate from normality. So that means we can move forward. We're going to go to Analyze, Compare Means, Paired Samples T-Test. Now remember, these data are not appropriate for the independent samples T-Test, which compares two totally different groups on a dependent variable assessed once. Rather, we have one group of people assessed twice. OK, so we move over our two variables in either order. You can move two week uh, follow up first and baseline second or vice versa. What happens is the your output is exactly the same except for the sign of your T. You can have a negative T value or a positive T value. In the end, it doesn't matter what the sign of the T test value is, rather just the absolute value, uh, the magnitude uh, in absolute value. That's all that matters. We disregard the sign of the T um, in this situation. So click, and we're not gonna estimate effect sizes here, so I'm gonna unclick that, and then we'll go through the basic output. Click OK. And the first table we have it is a table of descriptive statistics. We have our mean esophageal impedance values uh, for baseline 
and the mean for follow up. As you can see, the first value, the baseline uh, mean value at 2,671 is higher than that follow up of 1508. Now we we are expecting that. We are expecting that a healthy index of functioning, esophageal functioning, uh, that index is going to go down. The question is, is it a significant difference? We have yet to know. The second table is a simple Pearson R correlation value between uh, baseline and follow-up impedance, we would expect that these values would be correlated with one another. Why? Because they're the same people. So we're, we're, we have a correlation of the same people's values at assessment one and assessment two. We expect a correlation here, so that's fine. We go to the next and last table is where the actual t-test value is. Let's go through these values. The very first value here is the mean difference of the impedance between baseline and follow-up. It's just a simple subtraction between 2671 and 1508. That's what 1162 is, 1162.9. That's the numerator of this t-test if you were computing this by hand. This is the standard deviation of the paired differences. And this is the standard error of the mean. This is the denominator of this t-test if you were performing, if you were computing this by hand. And so if you take this value, the mean difference, and divide it by the standard error of the mean, you would get a t-value here of 4.936. And that's what happened here. The T is 4.936. The degrees of freedom are nine because the formula for degree, degrees of freedom for a paired samples t-test is N minus one. 10 minus one is nine. And here's our exact p-value. Now I'm going to note in earlier versions of SPSS, this p, uh, this column might read as 0.001 because what some versions, and there are many, will do, I'm going to double click on this here, is they rounded, SPSS might have rounded to 0 0.001. And so that is why in the book, when the p-value is reported, the p-value is actually reported as, as p equals 0 0.001. And, but here it's uh, reported as less than 0 0.001. This is actually the first version, this is uh, version 27, that I've ever seen SPSS report uh, report the p-value as APA wants you to report the p-value as less than 0 0.001. Sometimes you'll see versions of SPSS report a p-value as 0 0.000. Now as I've uh, told you in prior lectures and emphasized in the book, P is never actually an absolute zero. There is always decimal dust back there in the decimals. P is not actually reported as zero, um, but this is actually how APA dictates that you report in a manuscript or article uh, less than 0 0.001 if the p-value is very, very small. So an interesting difference between a, the current version of SPSS and past versions of SPSS. Nevertheless, the p-value is clearly less than our study alpha of 0 0.05, indicating this is indeed a significant difference and um, specifically a significant reduction or decrease in impedance from baseline to two-week follow-up. Now, uh, as, I, uh, as I explain in my what is a p-value video, um, there are two ways to determine the significance of a statistic. One is old school, candlelight, pen and paper. You compute the statistic, you get the, uh, you take your obtained statistical value and you compare it to a table distribution in a textbook or otherwise, such as Appendix A in your Grove and Cipher textbook. And uh, in that situation, if we only had our book, what we would do is is take our obtained T of 4.936 and compare it to the table uh, at degrees of freedom of 9. And we'll note that the critical value is 2.26.
And if our obtained value exceeds the table value, we know we have a significant difference at alpha equals 0 0.05. We do, of course, 4.936 is greater than 2.26. Remember, we're only dealing with absolute values here. We don't pay attention to the sign of the T. Uh, the second way uh, that we would determine the statistical significance of a statistic is, in fact, using our statistical software package here, where we get a more exact p-value. And that's what APA and AMA dictate that we report in our um, articles and manuscripts. No longer would we report p is less than 0 0.05. Rather, they would like the exact p-value unless the p-value is so, so very, very, very tiny. And in that situation, we report p is less than 0 0.001. So, as we look in our book at the final interpretation, this is uh, what it would look like, and this is the formatting that we would follow. A paired samples t-test computed on impedance revealed that patients with GERD undergoing PPI, PPI withdrawal had significantly lower impedance from baseline to post-treatment. You report the T, the degrees of freedom in parentheses, the value, and here this was performed with version 25. Version 25 gives a P of 0 0.001. Well, that's close. They rounded up. That's fine. It's okay. Uh, and then we, we report the means for clarity so that the reader knows, okay, well, what's the direction of, uh, of how the data went? And so we report the means. Thank you for watching.